tucked behind the houses of a small village in northern France. New burial plots await the remains of British and Commonwealth soldiers who have been found after more than a century. What is the story of this new First World War cemetery? I've taken the podcast on the road again and I've travelled this morning across on the Eurotunnel, come down the motorway into northern France and I'm close to the city of Lens, Lens, in the coal mining, the coal field area of northern France and I've come to one of the larger villages in this area, the village of luz goel or Luz, as it was known where the Battle of Luz took place in September and October of 1915. The Battle of Luz was a kind of turning point in the war on the Western Front from a British perspective because it was one of the first major British offensives of the war. The year 1915 had seen a whole series of offensives along the Western Front, New Chapelle, Albers Ridge, Festerbert, but this was a much bigger battle and some of those earlier attacks had been hampered by the unavailability of artillery shells for the guns. But that had been changed and that had been overcome and there was plenty of shells for this battle and plenty of guns and plenty of men as well because this was a battle which for the first time on the Western Front saw large numbers of men of Kitchener's army, the new army, taking part in it. It wasn't the very first time that Kitchener's army went into action. That had been at Suvla Bay, at Gallipoli, in August 1915, when men from several new army divisions, like the 10th Irish and the 13th Western Division and the 11th Northern Division, took part in the landings there. But here on the Western Front, this was the first big battle in which sizeable numbers of men from this new army created in 1914 following that call of Lord Kitchener for a hundred thousand volunteers and that first wave of those volunteers in 1914 were referred to as the first hundred thousand and many of the units formed from them including the 9th Scottish Division for example that was in the vanguard of the attack here in September 1915 they took part in this battle and as I come into Lou's British Cemetery, which is very much going to be the focus of this podcast, I can already see the Scottish nature of this battle as I scan my way across the headstones and see regiments like the Royal Scots and the Black Watch and the King's Own Scottish Borderers and the Highland Light Infantry amongst the many Scottish regiments represented in this burial ground. So Lou's was an important turning point but from a perspective of more than a hundred years it's perhaps one of the more forgotten battlefields and battles of the First World War. I've called this part of the old front line the forgotten front for many many years. When I did my first website all those years ago in the late 90s I had a whole section on there called the forgotten front looking at this ground between arm and tears and just north of Arras including a lot about Lou's and I know many of you are still waiting for it but my book on walking the Forgotten Front is still in preparation, it's almost finished and when I get a spare five minutes, whenever that will be, I aim to finish that off. But this area does not get anywhere near the level of visitors and it's not because it's not an important and significant cemetery or battle, it's just that the focus moves to those big names of which the Somme, Passchendaele, Ypres and perhaps the Hindenburg line you know are very much part of that. Luz is kind of sidelined as a consequence of it but yet it is this key turning point because it wasn't just the first use of Kitchener's men that was important about this battle but it's also where we see the British army begin to demonstrate how it fights these big battles. In this case it doesn't exactly lose it but it uh, is a battle that cost them dear in 1915. There's over 20,000 names on the Luz Memorial. It covers the whole war in this sector, but a very high percentage of those are men who fell in the 1915 battle. 
and there is a whole series of cemeteries scattered like those beacons of the Great Wars, I often refer to them as, across this flat landscape of the coalfields of northern France that bear testimony to the fighting here in 1915. But it's important as well because it also saw a change in command. Sir John French was the commander of the British Expeditionary Force when the Battle of Luz began and the failure of Luz to achieve a breakthrough. It was a, a three-pronged offensive, the, the 25th of September 1915, when this battle began, with the British attacking here at Luz, the French at Hill 145 and Suchet, near Arras, Vimy Ridge we'd call it, and also in the Champagne. And the idea was to rupture the German lines in three separate places, and a joint offensive on that kind of scale in three very different geographic areas was probably impossible. But it resulted in Sir John French being sacked and a new commander-in-chief appointed, which was Sir Douglas Haig, and he became the commander for the rest of the war for the armies on the Western Front, the British and Commonwealth armies on the Western Front. So it's an important battle in so many ways. And although we examine Luz through the prism of September, October 1915. It was part of the British front line for the rest of the war. And although there were no battles on that kind of scale again, really, for the rest of the conflict, there was lots of day-to-day -day activities of trench warfare. There were raids, there were gas attacks, there was tunnelling operations. And because of that, when you go into Lou's cemeteries, you often find as many men from other years of the war as you do from the 1915 battle. And Lewes British Cemetery, where I've started here, this is very much typical of that kind of experience. So when I look at the 2,800 graves that are in here, in fact it's more than 2,800, only 901 of those are identified soldiers, which is not untypical. Many of these men killed in 1915 battles would have only had one identity disc that was removed when they were buried so when they were found for reburial and this is a concentration cemetery where graves are moved in from the wider Luz battlefield there would be nothing on that body to say who they were so that kind of explains why there are so many unidentified and I walk down this row in front of me here I can see unknown Canadians an unknown soldier of the Somerset Light Infantry some completely unknown, a soldier of the Great War, known unto God, and a few other regiments besides. And there's one of those Scottish regiments looking at me now, an unknown soldier of the King's Own Scottish Borderers, almost certainly a 1915 casualty. And the sun has just come through the clouds across the cemetery now as I'm recording this, and casting long shadows across these headstones. And as I've said many times, I kind of feel these these cemeteries are, are like time capsules, really. Time capsules that I think continue to tell us so much about the history of the Great War. And we can discover much about the men that are buried in here. When you look through the cemetery register, it identifies burials by nation. And there's quite a sizable number of burials in here of men from Canada. We mentioned some of the unknown Canadians that I saw as I just walked in there. But there's actually 446 Canadian burials amongst that 2,850 that's in this cemetery. Now, Luz and Lens, which is literally just down the road from where I'm standing, is perhaps not a battlefield that you'd immediately associate with the Canadians. But very close to where I'm standing now is a place called Hill 70. And Hill 70, 70 metres above sea level, was an area fought over in the 1915 battle and then in August 1917. And the Canadian Corps, now under a new commander, Arthur Curry, took part in a battle at Hill 70 in August of 1917. So the vast majority of those more than 400 Canadian casualties buried in here are men who fell in that August 1917 battle at Hill 70 and 
just the other side of the old railway line that runs on an embankment at the back of the cemetery. As I look over the cemetery wall, I can see that embankment. It was a not a, a civil railway line. It was part of the coal mine that was here in Lewes that went up to the lifting gear. And there was a very famous pit head here that had two tall towers above it that could be seen from the British front line before the battle. Lou sat in a bit of a hollow, but these were very tall structures and they reminded the soldiers of Tower Bridge back in London and the position was known as Tower Bridge. And the embankment that had the railway line leading into that pit head is now a, a cycle and a bridleway and I can see they've built a new bridge across one part of it just ahead of me going towards where the old lifting gear was. There's no trace now of Tower Bridge, that's completely gone, but a famous structure in 1915. But just on the other side of that embankment is a Canadian memorial, a fairly recent memorial that was put up around the time of the centenary. And Hill 70 is probably one of the lesser known Canadian actions of the First World War, but very much reflected in the burials here. As I walk up into plot three of this cemetery, there's three entire rows, A, B and C, which are dominated by August 1917 and the Canadians that were here. And amongst the burials in the entire cemetery, but certainly in the Canadian sector of it, there are several teenage Tommies. There are three 16-year-olds in this cemetery and seven 17-year-olds. And of the three 16-year-olds, two of them are Canadians who fell at Hill 70, including Private Harold Lake of the 75th Canadians who fell on the 15th of August 1917 age 17 and he was from Ottawa in Canada. So like I say these time capsules of the Great War which these cemeteries are can continue to tell you so much about the subject and while I say that I've just walked up alongside the grave of a British soldier here Corporal Harold Francis Pocock of the Queen Victoria's Rifles who died on the 16th of October 1918 aged 28. So that was in the final battles around Lewes as the breakout and liberation of Lens took place at the very end of the First World War. But what's interesting is not so much that information as to who he was, his regiment, which is a battalion of the London Regiment, the 9th Londons, it's more the person inscription underneath. And that's where these headstones, these graves in this time capsule, can give up this information to help us understand more about the Great War. And on his inscription it reads, 1914 to October 1918. Our Heavenly Father knoweth best from mother and father. So he went over in November 1914 with one of those London battalions, one of the very first battalions of the London Regiment to go overseas, and he served continuously to October 1918, nearly four years on the front line. So we're looking at very much a veteran soldier, probably promoted from rifleman. His rank, final rank was corporal. He's seen so much during that period from the flatlands of Flanders to the battles of the Somme and who knows what else and he's killed in the last month of the Great War and not alone of course in that I wish to, that was a, a unique story but it's not it's not at all and interestingly we often I and mean, we've just talked about young soldiers in this cemetery and I'm standing here just either side of Corporal Pocock's grave are two older soldiers, Sapper Braden of the Royal Engineers, who died on the 20th of October 1918, aged 51, and Private W. Beaton of the Royal Scots, killed on the 16th of October 1918, aged 41. So they weren't all teenage Tommies, they were older men as well, and probably married men with big families back home. And, and I guess this is what I kind of mean really about these being time capsules, is that even just by looking at a few graves you can begin to unpick some of the stories and some of the complexity really of understanding the depth of the First World War and how it affected British society and wider empire, Commonwealth society with these losses. Now I've come here to lose British cemetery for a number of reasons. Firstly it's a cemetery that I've been to many times before. As I mentioned I was here for a ceremony for the centenary of the Battle of Lewes in September 2015 but I came here back in the 1980s for the very first time because one of the veterans that I knew then and I'd been to see on many occasions and become very good friends with him who I've mentioned many times on this podcast Malcolm Vivian 
he had been here with his siege guns, 96 siege battery, in 1917. And his siege battery unit had been attached to the Canadian Corps. So when they moved over and took over this sector around Lens, it was Malcolm's guns, one of the British artillery units attached to them, that helped them in the defence of their positions in this sector. And then when the attack on Hill 70 went in, they gave them fire support. And I think pretty sure that his unit had also assisted them in the fighting at Vimy in April of 1917. The Canadian Corps obviously had its own siege artillery, it had its own Canadian field artillery, but Sir Julian Bing, who was the commander of the Canadian Corps for the attack at Vimy, had realised that he needed even more artillery assets to assist with his bombardment, so had brought in a lot of British gunners, particularly from heavy artillery groups that had siege batteries with 6-inch, or in the case of Malcolm's unit, 9.2-inch guns to provide heavy fire support. And I came here for a couple of reasons. Malcolm Vivian's siege guns were in a fire position for that 1917 operations here, and his battery position had come under fire, and they had the guns all set up ready to fire. The 9.2s had a shell that was put into the breech of the gun, and then a charge bag with the powder that would propel the shell through the barrel was then placed in behind the shell, and the breech closed, and then a lanyard was pulled, which then ignited a cartridge inside the breech, which ignited the powder, and then propelled the shell out of the end of the gun. But the guns were set up, all ready to fire, with the charge bags close by, and they suddenly came under German counter-battery fire. So the Germans had spotted where their gun position was and started dropping shells on it. Now, you could not dismantle a 9.2-inch gun quickly. It had a two-and-a-half-ton dirt box behind it that absorbed the recoil of, of the gun. So that took a while to fill, and it took a while to unfill, to take all the earth out, to move the gun. So there was no option to move the guns, but more importantly, the cordite bags for the propellant were lying next to the guns. And if they got hit by a shell, then it's a fair chance that the whole gun would be wrecked. And as Malcolm described to me, he had a kind of moment at that point. His mind flashed back to Sayre on the 13th of November 1916, when he'd seen the men of the Hull Powers go into the attack there, and he'd seen them massacred in no man's land, walking through the mud or trying to advance through the mud, being torn to bits by machine gun and trench mortar fire and artillery fire. And he vowed that if he could ever do anything to stop that from happening, then he would. And he saw this as his moment, because the barrage that they were going to drop down for the Canadians was vital to their operations, and Malcolm wanted to make sure that they did their job. So to stop the gun destroyed, he ran out in the midst of this artillery fire and he picked up these huge cordite bags and he carried them to an empty dugout and threw them down the steps to dispose of them. And that meant, although shells dropped near to the guns, none of the cordite bags exploded and none of the guns were damaged. And for that, he was awarded the Military Cross. Now, Malcolm was a, a very, very modest individual. And it took me quite a few visits and a long time to get that story out of him because his military cross, I think it appeared in a birthday honours list, so there's no citation in the London Gazette for it. And it took a bit of cajoling. And there's a bit of detail in the privately published siege battery history of his unit, but he had the original recommendation that he allowed me to look at and read. And then he obviously told me more about that story himself. But it, these veterans wouldn't just, they wouldn't blow their own trumpet. They weren't those kind of men. And they were very modest about the things, particularly acts of bravery that they'd been a part of. So he tried to play that down. But I was a kind of determined interviewer and I wanted to get the true story of what had happened and managed to, thankfully, managed to get that out of him. And I got him to write about it as well because he used to send me all these letters running through his experiences. So that was one reason that I came here to lose in the 80s, was to see where Malcolm had been. But I also came here because there were several men from his siege battery buried in this cemetery. And, and I came to visit their graves on his behalf. 
I mean, he remembered them being killed, but he wasn't sure where they'd been buried. And in fact, they're, and I've just walked up to their graves now, there are special memorials along the wall of the cemetery. So they're men, there's no soldier buried underneath these headstones as special memorials. They're memorials to men known to be buried in the cemetery, but the exact location of their grave is not known. And there's several of them, in fact, three I'm looking at now, men from his siege battery who died supporting the Canadians on the 15th of August 1917, including Archie Staines, who the register says was one of three brothers killed in the Great War. They were from Hadley in Essex, and two other gunners, Neil and Wayne, close by. And there's an aircraft just flying over me now because we mentioned Hill 70, which is just to the north of Lewes, where I am now. And there's a little airstrip there today. So that's not the hun in the sun that's just come down to buzz me when I'm talking to you. It's a private civilian aircraft that's just taken off from the Hill 70 runway, about a kilometre from, uh, from, from where I'm standing. So I came here for that. And, and over the years, I've made quite a few private visits for passengers who've travelled on ledger tours who had relatives buried in this cemetery but these are not the reasons I've returned here today although it's good to reminisce about that and good to remember Malcolm and the incredible contribution that he made to my understanding of the of the Great War but it's because this cemetery now has a new extension and a new extension that has created the latest brand new cemetery with men from the Great War buried in it. And that's what we're going to go and look at now. I've walked over to the far end of Lewes British Cemetery where the back wall of the cemetery is located. And on previous visits here, before this extension was made, this was a place where I could bring a group to the back wall and we could look across to the embankment that I can see just through the trees ahead of me now with that new bridge with a couple walking their dog across it heading down towards where the site of Tower Bridge was and I could talk to a group about what happened here in 1915 and the importance of this, this structure and what Tower Bridge looked like and I'll put a picture of Tower Bridge onto the podcast website so you can, uh, so you can see it. But what's happened now is the Commission have created two gaps in the back end of this cemetery wall to allow you access into this new extension. And I'm looking at what I can see by the kind of planting of the grass, four or six separate plots, potential plots of graves ahead of me, but with only one plot with a couple of dozen headstones in it and I'm going to walk up there in just a moment to have a look at those graves. I've not been up previously to see them and we're just going to kind of walk along them and I'll give you my impressions of what I'm seeing there and kind of what this tells us about the nature of these new burials. But they've landscaped this site around me, there's several new Portland stone benches, they've planted some new trees along the edges and again I'll take some photographs of this and I can see a new gateway just ahead of us there for the Lewes British Cemetery extension with some wrought iron bronze gates attached to a walkway that takes you up onto the embankment that once led to where Tower Bridge was and this is all part of a general kind of walking and cycling route uh, within Lewes itself. But the importance of what I'm looking at now is something I can't actually define. I can't tell you what is going to be in these plots. I can't predict what burials will be brought here. And you might ask yourself why, and this is pretty big, it's the size of a, of a football pitch if not bigger, why has the Commission constructed a new extension like this? Why have they built essentially a brand new First World War cemetery? What is happening here to make this necessary? Well, there's a few things. In the city of Lens, there's a lot of expansion going on. And as I understand it, they've been building a brand new hospital complex here. And during the construction of that hospital in the last two years, 18 months, something like that, they have found a substantial number of human remains from the First World War, soldiers who were killed in that sector. I've heard all kinds of numbers for this. 
I believe it's well above 100. It could be nearly a couple of hundred soldiers that have been found during that construction work. The vast majority of them, as I understand it, are Canadians, which would make sense because where this hospital has been built is very much in the Canadian sector of 1917 when they were in action around Hill 70. But also the Canadian Corps returned there after Passchendaele and spent a chunk of the winter of 1917-18 in the Enns and northern Vimy Ridge sector. So it's a place that the Canadian Corps and Canadian casualties in the day-to-day -day activities of, of trench warfare during that period were occurring, not just in big battles where they'd fought the previous August at Hill 70. So it would make sense if this hospital had been built in that area of the battlefields and they're discovering remains that perhaps were once buried in forward battlefield cemeteries that somehow have been lost. It would make sense, given where this is, for them to contain a large number of potential Canadian burials. And the interesting thing there is that Canadian records from the First World War survive intact. And many of those Canadian records, having looked at a lot of them myself, researching Canadian soldiers over uh, the years, many of those Canadian records contain dental records, for example, which obviously could be used to potentially identify soldiers who are being found on a battlefield more than a century later. But also, there's quite a narrow time frame of Canadian missing from that period. So it would be from July, August 1917 in the prelude and the period of the, the Battle of Hill 70 through to that winter of 1917-18. And if you extracted Canadian soldiers who were missing from the list of names that are on the Vimy Memorial, then you would have a definitive list of soldiers who could potentially be amongst those whose remains have been found during this construction work at Lens. Now, given that the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, along with the MOD war detectives and the Canadian equivalent of that, do a lot of forensic work to identify soldiers whose remains are found on the battlefields today, and that using modern forensic analysis and also DNA, they can potentially identify many soldiers that are found. And with a project like this, I believe they put out a kind of a call for the next of kin of soldiers who might be amongst those who fell in that area during that period to give DNA samples to see if any of them matched with the remains that have been found. But whether these men are eventually identified or not, they will be properly buried. And that's what this new extension is partially about. So what the plan here amongst this series of, at the moment, vacant plots apart from one, where there's these couple of dozen burials, what the plan is, I believe, is to then move in those remains once they are identified or not to be properly buried in this new extension. And because there is such a large number of them, there wasn't a cemetery in this area where they could be easily reburied. And that created the necessity to acquire extra land like this and create this new cemetery extension. So, so what we're seeing here is something that we often talk about on this podcast. The pages of Great War history keep turning and we're seeing that visibly here with the construction of essentially a brand new British and Commonwealth Cemetery from the First World War. So great is the level of human remains that have been found in this area that it's needed a new cemetery to cope with the substantial numbers of soldiers who quite literally are being brought in from the cold here. And I've no idea what percentage of those men will be subsequently identified, but using that work carried out by all those different agencies, then it could be quite high, which again is an incredible part of our continued understanding and our continual acquisition of knowledge really in terms of the history of the Great War and those pages just always, always turning. So that's on one level. The work that's been going on here at Lens, construction of this new hospital, the necessity to have a place to bury the soldiers most of them, by the look of it, Canadian, 
who were found in that area. And this is something I'm sure we will return to because as that cemetery is properly created and, and this extension is added to, we will see the story of who those men were, where they fit into the story of Canada and the Great War and the Canadian Corps exploits in this area. We will see that unfold and I'm sure we will return here to, to talk about that. But that's only one level of why this extension is here because if you go back a few podcast episodes, probably a couple of seasons, I did a podcast about the Canal du Nord and that's that big canal that runs from northern France down towards the Somme and there's a project in hand to connect all that up, to widen that canal, to remove logistics transport from the roads and motorways of France and put them onto a canal to make them more eco-friendly and that construction work I think begins next year and will go on for many years creating this super canal and a canal that already runs across those battlefields of 1917-18. Many of those battles in the Hindenburg Line were named after the Canal du Nord. And again, there's a big Canadian connection here because the Canadian Corps, still under the command of Arthur Curry, fought some of its most important battles of 1918 in the Canal du Nord sector in those final offensives on the Western Front. So with the construction of that super canal, which is going to expand the width of that canal two or threefold, then you're going to see huge acreage, huge hectareage of land in northern France suddenly have construction work taking place in and around it because they're going to have to build facilities for the canal around the canal itself. So this will mean that a lot of soil will be disturbed and when that soil is disturbed there's a very high chance of human remains being found. Now, it is impossible to speculate just how many soldiers might be found during the construction of that Canal du Nord super canal, but it could easily be in the hundreds, if not more. So when I look at the vacant plots just around me now with the sunshine catching the top of the grass here and again casting shadows from some of the small plants in here across this area of open land. One day, this cemetery will almost be full of burials and some will come from Lons and some will come from the Canal du Nord. There will be, I would guess, a very high percentage of those burials would have a Canadian connection, but I'm sure through the discovery of those human remains, through this ongoing understanding of the First World War that projects like this kind of bring into sharp focus, we will discover many, many incredible human stories of more than a century ago. So it's fascinating. You know, it's an empty plot. It's a vacant plot at the moment, the vast majority of the ground in this extension that I've walked into. But one day, soldiers who've remained buried beneath that landscape of the Western Front that last witness of the First World War, as we often described it, that witness is still giving up its secrets. And those secrets will be brought here to be honoured forevermore by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission in this brand new Great War Cemetery. So I'm going to walk up to the back of this plot now to go and have a look at those initial burials here and see what that tells us about what might be coming down the line. One of the great things about being back in the southeast of England now is that I'm so close to the battlefields and it's very easy for me to come across like this and report on what is happening out here. Having these recordings actually made on the battlefields, on site as it were, is a really important part of what we need to do with this podcast. But I've walked up now to this new plot and I thought there was a couple of dozen burials here. There's actually more like 50 headstones and I'm looking at the initial part of it now and this first plot of them are unknowns they're completely unidentified soldiers but two of the headstones in front of me are soldiers multiple soldiers buried in one grave so they've both got two soldiers of the great war written on those headstones so these are men who are completely unidentified there was nothing apparently with their remains to identify even their british and commonwealth nationality or regiment but what was with them gave them enough of an identity to be identified as a British, potential British or Commonwealth soldier. So these are not Germans or French soldiers, they are unknown 
British and Commonwealth soldiers from the Great War. If they'd have been from those other nationalities, they would have been taken to their respective cemeteries for burial there. And who knows, amongst the burials that have been found, there may have been men from, from other nations who have been taken to a German or a French cemetery. But as yet, that information has not been released. But I'll go along the back row first, which looks to be, by the fairly established look of the graves here, with plants and a proper border, to have been some of the first reburials here. And I'm not sure whether these are from Lons or whether these were outstanding from a lot of the other development activity around the wider Luz area, whether these have been brought in and haven't been found perhaps possibly even pre-COVID. I don't, I don't think the information on that side of how these men have been discovered has yet been released. But what I'm looking at here, just by the cap badges, and this entire row that I'm looking at here in the middle are all unidentified, but in some cases there is some indication of unit. So I'm looking at an unknown Seaforth Highlander, an unknown Cameronian Scottish Rifles, an unknown King's Own Scottish Borders, an unknown Highland Light Infantry, an unknown Gordon Highlander, and two unknown Cameron Highlanders. And then on the other headstones where there's no cap badge, all of them say a soldier of the Great War, a Scottish regiment. So they've found objects with those remains that point to the fact that these men are part of a Scottish regiment, perhaps a fraction of kilt, perhaps some of the, the metal fittings from the kilt that's indicated this was a, a kilted regiment, Scottish regiment, I mean, who knows? But these are almost certainly men from the Battle of Lewes, casualties of the Battle of Lewes, September and October 1915, and if these men were found perhaps just up the road near Hill 70, where that aircraft we heard took off from, then these are almost certainly men from either the 9th Scottish or the 15th Scottish Division, most likely the 15th Scottish Division. But a number of other Scottish units served here at Lewes, so it's just speculation. We'll probably never be able to tie these down to a division, let alone a battalion, but we can safely say, I think, that these are from the 1915 battle. So whoever these lads are, having now been recovered, brought in from the cold, properly buried here, then their names will be recorded on the Lewes Memorial to the Missing just up the road at Dud Corner Cemetery. And having walked to the end of that row, there's a couple of completely unknown soldiers, soldier of the Great War, known unto God, and then there's some more Scottish soldiers. So some Cameron Highlanders, some Seaforth Highlanders, a Gordon Highlander and a King's Own Scottish Border as soldier, all unknown. So again, I would guess that these are men recovered from the same kind of area, and again, almost certainly from that 1915 Battle of Lewes. Now, when I come into the next plot behind me, and as I mentioned to you, by the look of it, having looked now down across from the top of the plots that are here, there's about six to eight defined plots in the way the grass has been laid out, where they're going to be burying those casualties from Lens and possibly one day from the, from the Canal du Nord excavations. I'm coming down into the most recent burials now where there's a lot of disturbed ground. There's a section of timber over what is almost certainly the latest soldier to be buried there. There's no headstones up at that particular point uh, because they haven't got round to doing that. They're waiting for the, the ground to stabilise, I would guess, before the headstone is put in place. But that brings me round to the next plot of graves where there's been some recent reburials, but there are headstones up. And the same kind of Scottish connection continues with these burials here because I'm now looking at a soldier, an unknown soldier of the Black Watch, a soldier of the Great War, a Scottish regiment and another King's Own Scottish Borderers. So whether they are connected to the burials behind or these are soldiers that have been found again in the wider kind of Lewes area because every year right across this landscape of the First World War soldiers are found with the construction of wind farms, with the construction of new buildings, with the construction of roads and with the wider kind of development that goes that goes on here. But as I move into the next plot 
the vast majority of these are completely unknown, soldiers of the Great War. A few where it mentions Scottish Regiment, one soldier of the Black Watch, and, and then some unknown soldiers at the end. So when I look at this initial plot of burials here, they're all unknown. And that's not really surprising when, as I'm pretty sure these men are, if they're casualties from 1915, they would have been killed on the battlefield with only one identity disc, which would almost certainly be the red fibre dog tag that they wore in that period of the conflict. If they were buried by their mates, that tag would be removed and handed in to an officer. Or if they were buried and the tag remained with the body, which is unusual for that to happen, but even if it had happened, after a century, that fibrous tag just does not survive in the kind of ground that, that they have here in northern France, so there'll be no trace of anything with a name on. The only occasion in which I know that uh, a red or green identity disc has been found semi-intact has been in Flanders, where the wet nature of the ground there preserves material like that. Here in the more kind of chalky landscape of Luz, close to the coal fields and the chalk downlands of Arras and the Somme, then the soil here is very, very different and doesn't preserve material like that. So, although these men could not be identified, I don't know whether they still regularly take a DNA sample from soldiers now and keep that stored in case at some point in the future someone is able to step forward and a match is made. They certainly did that with the Fromel project. The last cemetery created like this was Pheasant Wood, which is quite some time ago now, when a large mass grave of Australian soldiers from the July 1916 battle were found on that sector. Although these men are unknown, they're com completely unidentified or partially linked to a regiment, they're still buried with honour, just as they should be. And I think that is one of the, the great achievements of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, that they, they honour these men irrespective of when or how they died, and even when their remains are found more than a century later, even if they can't be identified, they are buried here with honour and dignity in this new First World War British and Commonwealth Cemetery. But these are, if you like, these are the advance guard. These are the first men to be placed here in this new burial ground. And they look now down across the vacant plots where further comrades will join them. Who knows what men will be brought here? Who knows what stories will be found with the burials that will be honoured here for all time. And when we come back in a decade, who knows what stories we'll be able to tell. But as we've said time and again in this episode, this is perhaps one of the most visible examples of how the pages of First World War history keep turning. The history of that war, unlike its very nature, is not static. It never exists in isolation. And the battlefields, the landscape, cherished and, and held these men beneath its soil for more than a hundred years and through circumstance they have now been found and lie here side by side in this comrade's corner of this new cemetery and it makes me reflect that no matter how many times how many years how many decades I spend walking this ground each time I return here I find something new a new pathway, a new story, new long shadows across that old front line. You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcor. You can follow the podcast at Old Front Line Pod. Check out the website at oldfrontline.co.uk where you'll find lots of podcast extras and photographs and links to books that are mentioned in the podcast. And if you feel like supporting us, you can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash oldfrontline, or support us on Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash oldfrontline. Links to all of these are on our website. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon.